supposed to be? <laughs>
read Psalm 91 today, but I invite you to read it. And even commit it to memory. I've been trying to do that for a while. It's kind of long. I don't remember things like I used to. But, even if you get the lines and stuff, it's okay. As long as you remember what it says. I invite you to read that. Um, you will not be passing the plate. There is a big yellow bucket in the back that you brought your tithes to put in the plate. You can give online. Um, there are directions online on how to do that. Um, so what I want to read to you is 2 Samuel 23, 15-17. Okay, so David is on the run from Saul. He's trying to kill him. And he's with his he's with his elite fighting group, the, the three. David remarked longingly to his men, Oh, how I would love to have some of that good water from the well by the gate of Bethlehem. So the three broke through the Philistine lines, drew some water from the well by the gate of Bethlehem, and brought it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out as an offering to the Lord. The Lord forbid that I should drink this, he exclaimed. This water is as precious as the blood of these men who risked their lives to bring it to me. So David didn't drink it. He loved his God so much that he worshipped him with it, with a grateful heart. He could have gulped it down and gave thanks. He could have drank half of it and sacrificed the rest. But he gave it all. So with grateful hearts and devotion, we must decide to tithe and we must decide how much. Amen. Worshipping as we do so. So we have special music but it's on video. What's here? I'm sure it'll be. Oh, there it is. Sure, it'll be back. And for being so supportive, especially I'm graduating this year, and I received a lot of cards from you guys, and they're really sweet. And I just want to tell you guys, I'm really thankful. So the song that I'll be singing today is called Man of Stars, and I really hope that you guys like it.
Look, it's not a pastor's calling to comment on current events. I really believe those should be kept separate. Because we comment on eternal events. But things have been happening so fast that I, I think I really need to talk about this. Got an article here by Stephanie Toon, Atlanta Journal Constitution, June 24. Talking about a man named Sean King, who was very active in the Black Lives Matter movement. And he released a tweet. Everybody watches tweets now since the president started tweeting. I don't know how to tweet. I don't even know how to chirp. <laughs> but Sean King wrote this. Yes, I think statues of a white European they claim is Jesus should also come down. I think they are a form of white supremacy. Always have been. In the Bible, when the family of Jesus wanted to hide and blend in, guess where they went? Egypt. Tear them down. Here's a second quote, another tweet. Yes, all murals and stained glass windows of white Jesus and his European mother and their white friends should also come down. They are a gross form of white supremacy, created as tools of oppression, racist propaganda. They should all come down. Now, believe it or not, Sean King does, have a, does kind of have a point. I've often been amused going in the library up here and other church libraries and looking in the old Bibles, and Jesus always had the longest, blondest hair and the bluest eyes. He's the most beautiful, even though he's supposed to be full blooded keeper, right? But Sean King is also very much wrong, and I'll tell you why. I have some pictures I want to show you here. Or Kurt is going to show you. There he is, um, Black Jesus. Here is Chinese Jesus being baptized by Chinese John the Baptist. Here is Chinese Jesus loving the little children. Here is Chinese Jesus saving Chinese Peter who is sinking beneath the waves through his lack of faith. Here again is black Jesus with his white disciples. Black Jesus. Black mother and child, baby Jesus. European blue-eyed Jesus. And another European Jesus. European Jesus. Black Jesus. Hebrew Jesus. Hebrew Jesus. Hebrew Jesus. This is, there's nothing wrong with this. We love Jesus, and we want, we want to identify with Jesus, and so we picture Jesus like ourselves. There's nothing wrong with this. In fact, that's exactly the reason Jesus Christ came. I'm going to read from Hebrews 4. Verse 14. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the hope we believe. This high priest of ours belongs to us because God wants him to belong to us, and we belong to him. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet was without sin, because he had the nature of God in him, not the nature of man. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and find grace to help us when we need it most. You see, God sent his word, made flesh, so we could connect with God through Jesus and so we could be saved by Jesus from the cross. So is it any wonder that we tend to picture Jesus as ourselves, like ourselves? The fact is, it doesn't really matter what color Jesus was, is, though he was full in Hebrew. What matters is what's going on in here. Amen. 
John 1, 14. The Word became flesh and lived for a while among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So He's wrong. You might be thinking, why are you doing this? Just one guy's tweeting. Yeah, I get that. But it's not just one guy. As we can have protests, which went into looting, which went into riots. Now, it's turned against churches, specifically church buildings at the moment. This is an article by Daniel Greenfield, a Shulman Journal. A Shulman Journal is a fellow. Anyway, he's a really good journalist. <laughs> You think this is easy, but it's not. <laughs> the assault on James St. John's Episcopal Church by radicals and racists was the ugliest moment of the D.C. riots. Not only was the famous 204-year-old church, which every president since Madison has attended, sprayed with graffiti, some of the thugs even tried to burn it down. The attack on President and President Trump's subsequent visit to the Church of the Presidents captured the attention of the nation. The victims of New York City's the victims of New York City's riots included St. Patrick's St. Patrick's Cathedral, St. Patrick's Cathedral, as the venerable 142-year-old building was defaced with obscenities and three letters BLM for Black Lives Matter along with George Floyd and No Justice, No Peace. In Richmond, Virginia, Beth Ahaba, a 225-year-old reformed Jewish congregation, had the windows of its grand 116-year-old building smashed by rioters. The building is now covered over by plywood. This is America. You understand it, right? St. Paul's Episcopal Church, 170-year-old building, also in Richmond, was the face with graffiti. Finally, rioters broke in Richmond broke the windows of the West Broad Church of Christ, an African American congregation. Some of the nationwide vandalism of, of churches and synagogues featured generic Black Lives Matter slogans, but some had hateful messages that were specifically targeted to houses of worship. The Cathedral Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in Denver, a 108 year old building, was at the center of some of the local riots. Vandalized with graffiti, reading pedophiles and God is dead. Rioters also targeted Our Lady of St. Lebanon, St. Peter's Cathedral, and Maronite Catholic Church in Los Angeles. The 83-year-old cathedral is also home to a Middle Eastern refugee congregation and the Black Lives Matter bigots reminded them of the persecution they had endured and fled by scrawling, kill all cops and make America pay for its crimes against black lives. I could go on, but I think I won't right now. It's not just one person. See, the far left, political, far left, not Democrats, I'm not talking about Democrats, the far left, and Antifa has targeted Christians because they see us as white supremacists, uh, justifying slavery, which was done. You know, Peter wrote, slaves, obey your masters, so, and that was used against, against freedom of slaves for many years. Um, they see us as white patriarchs, wives submit to your husbands, they forget all the rest, just wives submit to your husbands. They see us as criminals for a refusal to accept all lifestyles, sexual, all sexual lifestyles and genders. Should we be afraid? I mean, we are in the backwater here. Not exactly in the front lines of anything. But what if it did come here? Should we be afraid? Well, I saw something in the, the one-year Bible readings for this, for this week I want us to look at. 2 Kings 6, 2 Kings 6, I'm going to start with verse 8. 
2 Kings 6, 8. Now this was the time of the kings. Israel and Judah were separate now because of Solomon's disobedience. They were both kind of on a slow downward spiral, circling the drain. Israel much faster than Judah because Israel had total idol worshiping kings, one right after the other. So they got weaker and weaker and weaker. God pulled back his hand of blessing. Kind of like America, maybe? Judah was doing a little better because they had, they had got very godly kings, but also idolatrous kings. So it was kind of a salt and pepper thing with Judah. And during all this time, Elisha, Elijah's successor, is talking and talking to the kings and the people about God, trying to bring them back to the worship of God. This is what happened. Verse 8. When the king of Aram was at war with Israel, he would confer with his officers and say, We will mobilize our forces at such and such a place. So they were attacking Israel. Okay, we're going to mobilize our forces here and attack them here. But immediately Elisha, the man of God, this is funny, would warn the king of Israel, Do not go near that place, for the Arameans are planning to mobilize their troops there. So the king of Israel would send word to the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he would go on the alert there. What do you think of you, the king of Ram? Looks a little suspicious. Like the poker game where everybody's getting four aces every other hand. It looks a little suspicious. So the king of Aram became very upset over this. He called his officers together and demanded, Which of you is the traitor? Who has been informing the king of Israel of my plans? Okay, so now, King Abraham's officers are breaking a sweat. Doesn't have to be a fair trial. And they're kind of like standing there like, Ooh. But one speaks up and says this, It's not us, my lord the king. Some of the officers replied, Elisha, the prophet in Israel, tells the king of Israel, Even the words you speak, in the privacy of your bedroom. Yeehaw. Yeah. <laughs> so King Ram at this point should have, you know, okay, let's go attack somebody else. But no, people learn very slowly. Go and find out where he is, the king commanded, so I can send troops to seize him. And the report came back, Elijah is at Dotham. So one night King Ram sent a great army of many chariots and horses to surround the city. Now this is how weak Israel is. Dotham was only about 11 miles north of Samaria, the capital city of Israel. So he sends his army right to the center of Israel, capture Elisha. When the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning and went outside, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. How would you feel? Oh sir, what do we do now? The young man cried to Elisha. Get this next part. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him. For there are more on our side than on theirs. <laughs> yeah, I got a cheering section here. I like this. <laughs> I'm going to preach to her. <laughs> then Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes and let him see. Amen. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. Yeah. I wonder, in all this chaos, if God opened our eyes, what we would see right now. Well, I guarantee you there's something that you would see. This building would be glowing because it's, it's a place of worship. You, each of you, would be brilliant in your godly armor, described in Ephesians 6. I'm not making this up. It's biblical. And each of you would have guardian angels posted around you. Oh, yeah. about, they'd be about eight feet tall. They'd have a broadsword that would cut a man in half in a split second. And those angels keep demonic forces off you every day and every night. Amen. That's what we would see. Why don't we see it every day? I mean, that'd be fun to see that every day, right? Because God wants our attention on Him, that's why. 
We live by faith and not by sight. That's what the Bible says. So some Christians say, oh, God can't love me. I'm just a stinking, rotten, lousy sinner. And while they're saying that, they're glowing with the glory of God, and guardian angels are surrounding them. We just don't know what we have sometimes. Now it gets even funnier, okay? There's humor in the Bible if you look for it. As the enemy and army advanced toward him, Elisha prayed, Oh Lord, please make them blind. So the Lord struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Yeah. Yeah. Then Elisha went out and told them, You've come the wrong way. This isn't the, the right city. Follow me and I'll take you, to the man, take you to the man you're looking for. And he led them to the city of Samaria. So it's like, can you picture this? <laughs> They're all on it. they got all their swords. They're ready to go. Elisha's going to be lucky to make it back. And instead, they all go blind at the same time. And nobody says, why aren't we all blind at the same time? <laughs> nobody says that. And Elisha himself, the man they're looking for, comes up and says, Hey, wrong city, wrong guy. Follow me and I'll lead you there. <laughs> and so like puppies, they all follow Elisha. I mean, it's like, if you picture some of this stuff, but God see it fog their minds or masked what was happening, so they just followed Elisha. As soon as they entered Samaria, the capital city of Israel, Elijah prayed, Oh Lord, now open their eyes and let them see. So the Lord opened their eyes and they discovered that they were in the middle of Samaria. So imagine the American president sends 100, sends 5,000 troops to capture somebody. And they wake up and they're in the middle of Moscow on foot. Uh oh. Like Aaron says, ruh roh. <laughs> When the king of Israel saw them, he shouted to Elisha, My father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? Of course not, Elisha said. Do we kill prisoners of war? Give them food and drink and send them home again to their master. So the king made a great feast for them and then sent them home to their master. After that, the enemy and raiders stayed away from the land of Israel. <laughs> So, okay, this isn't working. <laughs> Don't be surprised at what's happening in the news in our nation. Don't be surprised. Jesus always told us this was happening. And he warned us not to scare us, but to encourage us. I'm going to John 10, 6 to 10. John chapter 10, 6 to 10. Jesus had just explained to his disciples that he's the good shepherd. He says this. Well, first, those who did after heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. So he explained it to them. I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All of them on the way, I'm on the way into heaven. Enter me, you enter heaven. Now just stop and think, think about that for a minute. Jesus didn't say, enter me and pay your tithe every week. Jesus didn't say, enter me and never say a dirty word again. Jesus didn't even say, enter me and never commit adultery or screw your life up in a horrible way. Jesus said, enter me and you have eternal life. How many of you have eternal life this morning? Yeah. There's a woo-hoo. There's a woo-hoo. <laughs> Where was I? I tell you the truth, I gave to the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers. But the true sheep, the ones who really believe in Jesus, didn't listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. Why is that? Because Jesus willingly came to earth and lived a perfect, perfect, perfect life in your place. And then when he was done, he 
went willingly to a cross. And God traded your life for his. <coughs> he took all your sins upon himself and into himself. Past, present, and future, known and unknown. And he gave you Jesus' perfect life. And when Jesus said, it is finished, that meant sin is finished. Sin in your life is finished. Oh. Not that you can't sin. Not that you, you should wallow in sin. <clears throat> that it's finished. You're done with it. Done. And then, God raised Jesus from the dead on the third day. Can anyone doubt this? After Jesus has been raised from the dead. Those who come through me will be saved. Not might be saved. Will be saved. They will come and go freely and find good pastures. The thief's purpose, that's Satan, is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Now we're seeing this mapped out right now in the headlines. Protests over a, 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 a a placement of meals on a man's neck till, he, till he's dead. Anger? Justified? Yeah. But then it goes to stealing. And then it goes to killing. Several people have been killed in these riots. And now it's into destroying. Even people who want to destroy the church. See, it's right here in the scriptures. But Jesus said, don't worry about that. I came so that you can have a rich and satisfying life. Amen. How many of you have a rich and satisfying life today? Raise your hands. Boy, I do. I'm telling you what, I'm so grateful to God for all He's done for me and all He still does for me. I'm so grateful to God. I don't want to go on for 10 hours here. I better, better cool it down. Jesus told us what to do in Matthew 10, 24 to 33. Matthew 10. 24 to 33. Jesus said, Students are not greater than their master, and slaves are not greater than, students are not better than their teacher, and slaves are not greater than their master. Students are to be like their teacher, and slaves are to be like their master. And since I, Jesus said, the master of the household, has been called the prince of demons, or Beelzebub, the members of my household will be called the even worse names. Don't feel bad when people call you names. They're not mad at you. They're mad at Jesus. And they're mad at Jesus in you. Sure they're going to call you names. Get this next part. But don't be afraid of those who threaten you. For a time is coming when everything that is covered will be revealed. And all that is secret will be made known to all. But I tell you now in the darkness, shout abroad when daybreak comes. When I whisper in your ear, shout from the housetop for all to hear. Jesus is Lord. Say it. Jesus, Jesus is Lord. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jesus says, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Amen. So you have eternal life. They can't take that away from you. Fear only God and the struggle of soul and body and hell. Fear God. How do you mean that? Don't deny Him. Stay with Him. No matter how hard it, how hard it gets, no matter how many people don't like you anymore, stick with God through Jesus Christ. What is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin? But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing about it. And the very hairs on Aaron's head are all numbered. <laughs> He's going to get me for this, you know that. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole block of sparrows. Everyone who acknowledges to me publicly here on earth I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. 
So there is one thing you have to do. Stay with Jesus. Don't be a chicken. Don't deny him. Remember you have eternal life. This life is temporary. That life's forever. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Don't you realize that all of you together, and Aaron is always making this point, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God lives in you? He actually does. God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple. You know when someone destroys you? Oh my goodness. They do not have a good future. It would be like someone, um, you have a toddler and someone walked up and kicked her in the head. They would not have a good future. It is exactly how God sees it. Sometimes I think we get the idea that God doesn't care when people die like as a Christian. Christians die for the glory of God, but God absolutely cares. Psalm 119 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the blood of his saints. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. What am I going to do if someone comes to this church and smashes in the windows and paints stuff on the walls outside? Well, first of all, I'm going to call Jeff Walters. <laughs> Then I'm going to ask for some plywood. Then I'm going to um, sweep up the, 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 the stuff. Then I'm going to sit down and worship God in the, in the house of the Lord. Mm-hmm. And if someone kills me, wow, I get to go to heaven. Amen. Isn't that right, Mike? That's right. I get to go to heaven. What do you have to lose? So what do we do about this? The thing we do is, first of all, don't give in to hate. Don't, 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 don't give in to hate. The second thing is, get closer to God than you've ever been before. And then, even in persecution, you can have joy. The Christians are doing it all over the world. The Chinese church had an estimated 100,000 Christians, if I remember the numbers right, when Mao Zedong took over. Now, they have an estimated 100 million Christians. Don't be scared, people. Don't be worried. Trust the living God. Stay joyful. And like Peter said, always be ready to give someone a reason for the hope you've had, that you have. We're going to sing a song. If you want to pray for any reason, come forward. If you'd like to give your life to Jesus this morning, come forward. And then we'll close. Way arena with many superstar athletes, famous movie stars, whatever else may be there, and people are groping to get a selfie taken with them to show their friends that they were in the same place as someone very famous. Post it on Facebook, Instagram, whatever, that I got to be in the presence of someone important. But when you walk into heaven, Not when Jesus he would acknowledge us before his Father in heaven. We have nothing to be afraid of. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for even the things that we can't see. The protections that are surrounding us on the hills for a thousand miles. Thank you for all the ways in which you've already got tomorrow planned. No matter what we read, see, hear, you're already there. Already planned. And already have a place established. Father, thank you for that. Thank you for that security. And Father, help us to uh, walk out of this place and share that. But Father, with the world that is full of fear, that is uncertain, that can't see and can't hear, uh, how much you love them. Allow them to see it in us and be drawn into your kingdom for your glory. For there are more with us than there are with them. Amen. Amen.